Well, guys, uh, once again, welcome to the final Indeed engineering talk of 2014. Uh, as uh, Jack mentioned, uh, we're going to have a talk followed by a brief demo, and then we're going to break out into a workshop. And we'll have lots of people around to, to help you get your own clusters up. Or uh, we also have a publicly available Immotep instance up. So even if you don't have your own, your own AWS account or your own data, uh, we can still help show you how to use Immotep, and then you can get it running later. So uh, uh, Jack said, my name's Tom Bergman. I'm the product manager at Indeed San Francisco. Uh, I moved out to San Francisco about three months ago with a new team to start building a new product for Indeed. Uh, you know, mini pitch. Uh, for those of you who've looked for jobs in the past, uh, past year or so, maybe you remember everybody has this big spreadsheet and you have all the companies you've talked to and the jobs and where you are in the process and what you have to do next. And so what we're trying to do is build a way to just magically track all that for you and automatically give you awesome recommendations. So uh, over the past couple of months, we worked really hard and we rolled out the very earliest V1 to a very, very small group of test uh, users uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I was really excited. We had this new product out. What's happening? Are, is, it, is it working? Are people seeing it? Uh, so for me, in that case, I turn to Imotap and I say, is it working? Um, is anybody there? So I go and I hit Imotap and I say, you know, are we, are we getting traffic? Um, and so you can see here, I have a query uh, at the top hitting Imotap and we have no traffic and then magic, we have traffic. Yay, it's working. Okay, cool. So it, it's on, uh, but are, are people using it correctly? Are the features working? Uh, so again, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask Imotap, uh, you know, is, is it working? So I'll say, hey, are, the, are these features on? Are, are people clicking these buttons? Are these pages loading? Is, are these events firing off? And I can say, OK, yes, they are. That's awesome. So I, and I can put in a query about some different things we're trying to track and, and see, if, see if they happened. Um, and I can also say, like, hey, how is this doing against, against other products we have at Indeed? How is this doing against previous versions of pages? So I can say, are, are we winning? Uh, and so you can see here, I'm actually querying three separate data sets. These are completely different data sets that have different bits of information. But I can say, you know, how is, how is this new product doing against the previous desktop version? How about against the previous mobile version, uh, et cetera? And I can graph all four of these at once and, and kind of pick through it. Uh, in addition to simple questions like these, I can go and ask a little bit more complicated questions like, OK, we're showing a promo to users uh, after they return back to the site uh, based on which different test groups and how long they're away from the site, what is the response rate? And I can put in a query to Amotep and, and get uh, a response bucketed by milliseconds that, that tells me how these response rates change. So cool, that's awesome. I can go and I can ask Amotep and, and get all the answers to my questions. Um, and you know, I like that, but it doesn't help you guys very much. So I want to get into how you guys can start using Amotep to do the same kind of stuff. Uh, first off, should uh, cover what is Imhotep. Um, probably heard this a thousand times, but I'll reiterate. Uh, Imhotep is indeed a highly scalable open source analytics platform. Uh, we just open sourced it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we're really excited about it. Um, what does the open source contain? Uh, there's really four kind of main parts to Imhotep. Uh, so we have the Imhotep daemons. This is the back end, the things that are actually uh, running those queries and producing the results for you. Uh, we have Imhotep query language, or IQL. This is going to be the query language that we use to ask questions to the daemons and uh, get response back. We have uh, we call the IQL web client. This is a, uh, a web-based app or a cloud-based app uh, that you can go to and type in a query and get responses right back in your browser. And then finally, we have this uh, TSV uh, slash CSV uploader. Uh, and this is another web-based tool where you can just drag and drop or upload a TSV of information, and we'll uh, suck that up into Imhotep and make it searchable. Um, so what, what does Imhotep do? Uh, there's two main things that we use Imhotep for that makes it really valuable to us. Uh, first, it lets us really easily upload files and compress them to very small sizes so we can get data into Imhotep really quickly. Uh, and then once the data is there, uh, we can do basically you know, real-time interactive queries on it uh, and get responses back uh, in real time. So that's, that's what's awesome about Imhotep to us. But uh, Imhotep is not uh, the first analytics tool we built at Indeed. We built some of the predecessors to Imhotep way back in 2010. Um, and Imhotep's the, the latest in this line. Um, over the course of building these different tools, we've learned a lot about what makes an analytics platform work, what makes it 
really useful, uh, what's really important to be able to have it be successful in the company. And so I wanted to go over kind of this philosophy that we took with us in building Emotep, why we built it the way we did, so that you can kind of understand those choices. First off, we think it's important that it's interactive. Uh, you need to be able to ask a question and very quickly get an answer back. Uh, we want to try to lower the barrier of entry to asking questions of Emotep. Um, so it's not, it's not hard to ask a question. I can ask a question, I get an answer right back. Um, you know, if, you, if you're having to wait a really long time for a response, you're going to ask less questions, you're going to understand your data less. Um, and because it's hard to formulate queries and takes a long time to get answers back, uh, less people are going to use it as well. So we just wanted to really lower that barrier of entry to asking questions uh, and to asking follow-on questions. Uh, if any of you guys have tried to do big data stuff in Hadoop, uh, you probably all know the pain of executing an incredibly long Hadoop query that then returns absolutely no results. So you wait 12 hours and you get nothing for it. That sucks. It's horrible. Um, and so with Emotap, we wanted to, to not have that happen. So uh, you know, we can ask a question. If it's wrong, um, you know, first we'll get an error before it even executes. But if it's, if it's not kind of directionally the right question, it's not quite the question we wanted to ask, ask it tweak it a little bit, tweak a little bit more, and finally get the answer. Um, and in fact, in reality, it really looks a lot more like this most of the time. Uh, ask a few questions, see something interesting, uh, pivot a bit more, try to find out what's really interesting about it, uh, and keep going until we find the really, really cool stuff, and then do a bunch more queries afterwards that maybe aren't quite as cool. Uh, but they're all so fast and so real time that it doesn't matter. Um, and by having it so easy to, to ask these questions, um, you know, everyone in the company can also get involved in it more. Uh, the other thing that we think is really important is to have the real true data there. Uh, we believe that we should never downsample the data because when we downsample the data, we make it really, really hard to drill down into the details um, and get good results. Um, you know, one way that people often make analytic systems fast is by doing aggressive downsampling. Um, anybody here who uses Google Analytics has tried to drill down into something very tiny and just get nonsensical results because they do so much downsampling, uh, you, can't really, you can't really understand it. So what we want to do is make sure that, that we have the real data there uh, accessible to us. Um, you know, if we are doing, you know, even if you do understand what's happening with the downsampling, there's assumptions that are made. Uh, and if you don't understand those assumptions, you're going to get uh, the wrong answers, interpret the questions the wrong way. So just real data. Um, and that lets us do things like, for example, here's just a, a query I pulled up for this talk. I'm looking at just one day in September uh, in the country of England where, uh, where the user came from Belgium and was looking for the query administrator. What are the, what are the top 10 titles and what is the click-through rate on those titles? And I can just easily run that query and see the precise real numbers for this very, very tiny data set from a while ago. Uh, so that we think that's really powerful. It helps us look into outliers. It helps us look into trends. It helps us do all kinds of things. Um, so what else do we think is really important? Uh, we thought it's really important to have a web-based tool to facilitate sharing. Uh, so if I, have a, if I have a program running on my computer, I have to get it set up, I, you know, I go and I execute it, I download the answers, and then I want to get somebody else's opinion on it, you know, they have to make sure they have the tool installed, they have to go then figure out how to do the same query that I did and get the same answers. Uh, with a web-based tool, I can do a query, I can look at the answers, I can then copy that link, send it over to somebody else in my team and say, hey, have a look at this. Um, and they can immediately see what I'm doing. They can you know, tweak the query a little bit, send it back to me. Well, what about this? And we can have this conversation here. Uh, so by having this web-based app that easily allows sharing, we kind of generate this you know, data-driven cult data culture where we can say, you know, show me the data. Don't just make an argument. Actually, show me what's really happening. Uh, so when PMs uh, at Indeed talk to each other, our conversations generally look a lot like this. Hey, dude, here's a query. Blah, 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 here's another query. Oh, really? Here's another query, and so on. Um, and so sometimes even when we're getting into really, really hairy tests, we'll have jury issue comments that look like this. Uh, shout out to the ridiculous amount of work Jan did to prove a point here. <laughs> um, so what else is really important? Talked about making it really easy to share results with other people. Um, if I execute a particularly uh, long query, I don't want to have somebody else have to wait at all to see it. You know, I want us to be joining conversation right there. Uh, so in Imhotep Web App, we do really aggressive caching of results so that I can do a query on my computer, I can send it over to someone in my team, and instantly they have the exact answer there. 
Uh, we don't have to wait uh, for it to execute on them and then send it to someone else and wait for it to execute. It just all works really fast and gets us out of talking about uh, how to get the data to actually talking about the data itself. Queryability. Um, it doesn't matter how fast you can get results if you can't easily formulate queries to get at that results. You know, we want to have a, a query language that's expressive enough that we can ask most of the questions we want um, and that we don't have to, that's not so incredibly verbose that it takes forever to write it. So um, before I get into what this query language looks like, it's probably helpful for me to talk about what the data inside Imhotep uh, looks like. So Imhotep data structures. Uh, the primary data structure of Imhotep is a data set. Uh, you can think of data set as being like a table in a relational database. Um, so, you know, we'll have maybe one data set that's all of our searches or one data set that's all of our applies or something like that. So, uh, once we have this data set, you know, any query we're asking is going to be a query we're asking to this specific data set. Um, then the key item of the data set, which is kind of the atomic unit of Imhotep, is going to be the document. Uh, and that's what what is this data set based around? And you can think of a document as like a, a denormalized row in our relational database. So we have this row, it's one item, and then we're going to have all the different information about that item. Um, the next thing is a field. Uh, you can think of a field as being like a column in a database, and you can think of a term as like being a value. Uh, so for example, maybe we have a, a data set that's about searches. And we might have one field that's the number of results, and so maybe it's 10 or 5 or 7. And we could have another field that's uh, the number, the job IDs, we're a job search company, so the job IDs that appear in that result. So maybe 1, 7, 5. Or maybe we want to know the, the number of which order were clicked, you know, 5, 3, 2. So this, this field, uh, this term can be either a single thing or it can be a series of things um, that are all associated with this field or this attribute of the document. Um, seeing as how the data structure can be kind of compared to relational database, uh, we thought that it made a lot of sense to uh, use some query language that's reminiscent of relational database. So we made a query language called Imhotep Query Language IQL. Uh, this is an expressive SQL-like language for aggregate analytics. So if you know SQL, you should be able to pick this up really quickly. If you don't know SQL, you should still be able to pick this up really quickly. Um, the, the base query is incredibly simple. There's only two requirements. Uh, choose a data set, uh, so which, you know, which table are we querying, which information are we querying, and we have a date range. Uh, Imhotep uh, assumes that all the documents are time series documents, uh, and so when you're choosing the date range, you're choosing you know, how big of a data set are you querying, how much data are you looking at. So if you just put in those two things, data set and date range, it's going to return to you the number of documents in that date range for that data set. But we can also have a lot of things we can add on to this query. So we have filters. Uh, filters are things like where field equals term, or field greater than term, or field in term one, term two. Uh, we also have group by. Uh, so if you're familiar with SQL, um, you know, we can group by things. But we can also do a limited group by. So we can say just group by users in test group one and test group two. And it will do a group by limited to just those two groups. Um, we also have metrics. Uh, like I was talking about before, uh, there's a lot of different attributes of the document that you might want to store uh, in a data set. For example, for a click, you might want to know, you know how much revenue that click took or how long it took for someone to do that click. Um, so those are all metrics. And we can do all sorts of math to them. We can do, you know, uh, times, plus, modulo, all kinds of different things to manipulate the metrics to get whatever we want. And so let me walk you through an example query here. Um, so first, the data set. So we're going to say from search results, in which case search results is the name of the data set. Um, we put the data set first uh, in the query because it enables us to do really smart autocomplete. Uh, if we don't know what the data set is, we can't autocomplete it. Uh, next, we have a date range. So in this case, we're going to be asking for all the documents uh, between uh, December 5th of last year, December 10th of last year, those five days. Then we have some filters. Uh, so we have this filter where country equals Ireland, and we also have uh, this inequality filter where the job age days is less than one. So it's going to be giving us all the search results that were in the country of Ireland and that were less than one day old. Uh, we can then do a group by. Uh, we group by, you can group by any of the fields, but we have a special group by which is called time, which accepts uh, inputs like days, minutes, hours, 
uh, seconds, etc. So you can just easily put in any kind of time that you want to slice it by, and it'll intelligently interpret it. And then finally, metrics. Uh, we can choose multiple metrics separated by comma. We could, for example, if we wanted to add those two together and do clicked plus count, although it wouldn't be super meaningful. Uh, so in this case, clicked is going to be the number of clicks on this result. And count is a special metric, meaning the number of documents in that set. So we're going to get the number of clicks and the number of jobs. Uh, so we'll put in a query, and we'll get a result like this in a table form. So we can see, uh, you know, there's a group by five days, so we have five groups. We have the clicks for the groups and the counts for the groups. And then we can just click over to a graph and then immediately see a graph of the same thing as fast as the JavaScript can draw it. Cool, you can, you can query the data, you can ask lots of questions about it, but you know, that's only as good as uh, the data that you have in there. Uh, and if it's not easy to get data into a system, you're not going to put it in there, and then you're not going to have it uh, to do uh, any queries on. So uh, extract, transform, load is a uh, you know, data warehousing term, uh, often referred to as ETL. This is like how we get the data out of the system it was in and into the new system that's going to do the analytics on it. Uh, so ETL for Emotep, we tried to make as easy as possible. We use it ourselves, and we want it to be really easy. Uh, so first extract, um, you know, you have to get your data out. Uh, if your data schema is really complicated, this part's going to be hard. Uh, if it's not, it won't be. Um, uh, so next, transform. Uh, so we have, um, we have a TSV uploader that's going to make it really easy. Uh, the only thing is there's a couple uh, things that you have to do. First denormalize your data. So for example, um, you can imagine like if you have all the information about uh, a document that's stored in maybe multiple databases, you might want to do a big join across all those databases and merge them together into one big table uh, so that then you have this all the information you care about that can then be uploaded. Uh, then you also have to do a little bit of stuff on formatting, so making sure the header is correct, the, uh, the date format needs to be in Unix format, uh, there's some things around the, what the title of the document is. Uh, but we actually have a linter script that will take care of most of that for you. So it should be pretty easy, and it's all outlined in the documentation. Uh, one more thing I can add is that as part of the, uh, the configuration of the formatting, you can configure whether you want the fields to be tokenized, whether you want them to be bigrams, and it'll just do that automatically for you when it's creating the, the data set. Um, so some example data sets we have here at Indeed, um, job search, ad clicks, resume contacts. Uh, one of the hardest things about setting up the data set is actually thinking about what do you want this denormalized document to be. Um, so in job search, uh, for us, this is we have one document for every load of a search results page. Uh, so this is going to be the primary document is a page load. As it is a page load, it doesn't make sense for that to be um, you know, very detailed information about, the, about a, an individual job, since there's going to be you know, 10, 20, 40 jobs on each thing. It's a lot of information to join in and isn't really applicable to this. Likewise, we have one thing that's ad clicks. It's just all of the sponsored clicks. So for this case, it makes sense to be, you know, what's the revenue associated with it, whereas um, you know, that might not make sense in other things. Um, and resume contacts, you can imagine. So really, the main thing, think about you know, what types of questions you want to ask and make sure that the data set that you're going to be putting into MLTAP is going to allow you to answer those questions. Um, uh, and then, you know, once you have that data ready, uh, we go into the load step, which is uh, we have this TSV, CSV uploader. You just drag it in there or go to the website and upload it, and then it'll slurp it up into MLTAP, and, you know, in a very short period of time, you'll be able to query on it. Um, for more complicated things, we also have a Java API so that you can actually build your own data sets and upload them uh, through the API. Uh, in practice, that indeed, we actually do about 50-50 each of these. Uh, one of the things we really liked about the, the TSV uploader is that um, when we get data from outside sources uh, or from Excel or from other programs that we're using, it's pretty easy to get that data into TSV format. Uh, and so we found that that was kind of the minimal uh, path that we could get things up in Nameltip. So once it actually puts it in Nameltip, how does it store it? Um, we're a search company, and we like to you know, go to search when we're thinking about how to solve this. Uh, so we use a, a data structure called an inverted index, which is a really common data structure used in search. Uh, it has a couple really good attributes, which is why we chose it. One, it offers massive compression. Uh, so we have a sample data set that you guys can see in a little bit uh, of Wikipedia data. Uh, uncompressed, it's about 2.5 terabytes. 
Uh, and then in, once we compress it into an inverted index, it comes out less than 250 gigs on disk. So that's really, really nice compression. It gets the data very small and lets us query it very quickly. Uh, also, by being an inverted index, it lets us do Boolean searches uh, much faster than if you're doing a query in just a traditional database. As, as we've said a number of times, it's open source. Uh, the open source package uh, is able to be run on basically any modern Intel uh, chipset, um, really any kind of modern processor, really. Uh, it's not going to run on you know, a cluster of smartphones yet, but who knows. Um, we also have it wrapped up so you can really easily get it uh, deployed into AWS via a CloudFormation script. So if you want to do AWS, it's super fast. You can get up and running, um, you guys know, in, in just basically three steps. So you create the S3 buckets, you create the key pair, you run the script, uh, and then done. You have, uh, you have an instance up and you can start working on it. So that's, that's the talk portion. That's, um, I think, everything you need to know to start uh, getting on DemoTap. Uh, before we hand it over to q and I want to go and demo some of the sample data sets, explain to you what, what they contain, uh, and kind of guide you towards some interesting queries you might want to do. Uh, so our first sample data set uh, on our demo cluster uh, and on the sample data set page in the documentation, uh, we have it called NASA here. Uh, and this is a selection of Apache logs from NASA's public website from July to September, or just basically July and August of 1995. Uh, it's a public data set we uploaded here. Um, probably most of you are familiar with Apache logs, so we figured it would be a good, data, good place to start. Uh, so right now I have this query ready uh, from NASA, selecting the data set, and a time range of, it's a little smaller, um, you know, July through the end of August, and I'll run, and we can see uh, in this data set, there's 3.4 million documents, so 3.4 million Apache logs uh, during this two-month time range. Uh, now I can walk you through some of the cool fields. So we have all the fields here are, are indexed, and when we click on it, it's going to do a group by and show us all the most common terms. So for example, we have this field here called host. Uh, it's a little bit misleading, but in this case, host is where the source of where this traffic came from. So as you guys can see, in 1995, <laughs> Prodigy was still very, very popular, um, as was AOL.com. Um, we can then go look, click on method. Uh, and this is going to give us the method. Uh, as you can see, primarily gets with a few heads and posts. Uh, we can click on response. And this is going to be the response message. Uh, we got a lot of 200s, some 404s. Um, probably the most interesting field here is going to be URL. So this is the URL that was requested. And if we look here, the most common requested URLs, we can see that 1995 was a much jiffier web than we live in today. Um, so uh, it's kind of hard to see what's going on through all these images. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a filter here to get rid of it. So I'm going to add a uh, regex filter on URL to exclude all document, all URLs that contain uh, .gif. So we have now removed all the GIFs. So now we're looking at the top 1,000 URLs that don't end in .gif. Uh, if we scroll down, uh, we can see here at number seven, we have shuttle countdown liftoff.html. Now I happen to know that this is the URL for the much publicized at the time uh, shuttle countdown liftoff page. So this is going to be where people could go and see a countdown timer before a shuttle takes off. So if I click on this here, it's going to automatically add it uh, into the where as a filter. And if I were to execute the query again, I'll see there's just one URL now, because uh, I'm looking for all the URLs that are this. Um, so if we want to then go and pivot, we can then look at time. So I'll set time one day and run. And what we'll see here is the number of requests to shuttle countdown liftoff.html per day. And looking at this, we can see that uh, traffic was kind of low, and then it spiked up massively on July 13th. Uh, now I happen to know that July 13th, uh, uh, 1995, there was a Discovery shuttle launch that people talked about a lot. And so we can see there's a huge surge in traffic to this countdown page uh, when the shuttle was taking off. And we can, in fact, go from days to hours, uh, get more granularity very quickly, and we can see that 
In fact, uh, everyone was there early in the morning when the shuttle was taking off and then didn't come back after. Um, I'm going to move on to the next data set. Uh, we have uh, Wikipedia. Uh, so this data set here is a public dump of all the pages uh, in Wikipedia which received traffic uh, during the month of September. Uh, this is, again, a huge data set. It's uh, raw 2.5 terabytes. Even on disk, it's 250 gigs. So it's very, very, very big. Um, I will call out the, uh, the unit, so the document for this index is actually a hourly roll-up of logs for a page. So if we were to do a query and look for counts, uh, it's going to give us 24 counts per page each day, because each day has uh, one, one document per hour. Uh, so instead, what we're going to want to use is a metric, uh, num requests, which is going to be the number of requests. So I'm going to go execute this now, and hopefully it'll go fast. Um, and we'll see how many requests there were in the entire month. So we see there's about uh, 6.8 billion uh, requests to Wikipedia during the month of September. Um, now, that was fast, but I still don't want to anger the, dem the demo gods here. So I'm going to shorten the time range a little bit. Uh, we're going to go just down to, we'll pick a seemingly arbitrary date of September 19th. Um, and I will filter on title. Uh, there's a couple other uh, things here. There's the categories, the links out, uh, which is going to tell you all the links out of that page, uh, requests, title words. But I'm, I'm going to focus on title, since I think that's easiest to get across. Uh, this is giving me title top 1,000 by count. Uh, count is not super meaningful in this index. So instead, we're going to ask for the top 1,000 by num requests. And it's going to resort it. And what we're going to see here once this query executes is for September the 18th, what are the top pages of Wikipedia by the number of requests they received? Um, let me kind of make it a little bit bigger so people can see. Um, so top is the main page with 13 million, uh, followed by two undefines that appear in every day, and then less Unix. Uh, I don't know why this is here, but it's here in every single day for September. Um, so maybe you guys can dig into it and find out. It's a mystery to me. Um, but if we scroll down a little bit, we see the Scottish independence referendum is the next highest thing. And uh, this makes sense because it turns out that uh, September 18th of uh, this year was the day of the Scottish referendum. And if we scroll down a little bit further, we see that uh, Scotland was number 12. Um, so that's cool. Uh, it makes sense. These were both very popular on the day that they were happening. But we can actually go and say, what, uh, what was the popularity of these pages throughout the entire month? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a second uh, qu a second query here is going to let us do two queries at once. Um, I'm going to then set this to September 1st through about, let's say, the 25th. And I can press here to copy it down. Uh, I'll then going to click here to add the style, title uh, Scottish Referendum. And also click here to get Scotland. But I'll just uh, delete this and delete this. So now we have two identical queries looking at the time range, September first through the 25th, uh, comparing the title of Scottish Independence Referendum 2014 to title Scotland. I'm going to go ahead and change this group by to time one day and copy it down again. And then we'll be able to see how the popularity of these two related queries changed over the course of the month. So I'm going to run this, switch over to a graph. Oh, so this is that uh, aggressive caching I was telling you guys about. Um, so as you can see, at the beginning of the month, there was basically very, very little uh, interest in Scotland or the Scottish independence referendum. Uh, they both go up at the same time, around the 8th. Um, and then they peak on the 19th, one day after, uh, and then go back down to normal. Um, and you can see these, these lines track each other very closely. It seems that there were not very many people interested in Scotland outside of the context of the Scottish referendum. Uh, so that's the Wikipedia data set. There's it's very, very big. There's lots of cool stuff in it. Uh, I highly encourage you guys to explore it. Um, but I'll leave some of those mysteries for you and move on to our final uh, demo data set, which is called World Cup 2014. Uh, so earlier I said that Imhotep expects that the data is going to be a time series. 
Um, so all the tools were built around it being a time series, and we use time series on all of our logs, so it's really easy. But occasionally, we need to use it for non-time series stuff, and it can easily do that. All you have to do is just set uh, the time ser the timestamp for everything to be one specific day, or set the title to be one day. Um, so we've just indexed this data set all on this day, July 1st. If I query July 1st, I'll get all the data in the data set. Um, and this data set, uh, I will say the document for it is a player in the World Cup. So when I ask for counts, it's going to give me the number of players matching my query. So I'll just run this now, and we'll see uh, in World Cup 2014, there were 736 players. Um, so we have a couple different fields. We have age, the age of the player, captain, it's a Boolean, are they captain or not? Uh, what club did they play for? Um, I think a lot of these are fairly uh, easy to understand. I will say rank is the rank of the team, so all players on the team are going to have the same rank. And finally, selections is going to be the number of times they've played for their national team. Um, so what I'll do first is we'll just look at uh, when the we'll do a group by captain. So we're going to group by is it captain? Yes, no. And we'll go. Let's see what the how the age of a captain compares to other people. So I'm going to add uh, age divided by count. Uh, so whenever we want to get an average in MLTAP, we're going to divide by count. So in this case, this is going to be age of the group divided by the number of documents in the group, or age of all the captains combined divided by the total number of captains. Um, and then we'll also look at selections divided by count, or the average number of selections. We will see here that uh, captains are, on average, about five years older than non-captains, um, and have played, on average, about three times as many games uh, for their national team. Uh, we can also, uh, for instance, since we know that there's only one document per player, we can do some fun stuff and say, let's get some information about the captains. Uh, so we'll say where captain is one. Uh, let's uh, group by player, which is going to be their name. And then we'll also group by country. Here I'm going to add closed brackets to say, uh, don't show me results if they're zero. So it's not going to give me uh, the cross product of everything. It's just going to give me the country for that player. I'll do the same thing with club, the club they play with normally, um, and their age. Um, and when I get it, we'll see that um, ah, forgot to bracket out age. Here we go. So then we can see uh, the oldest captain in the World Cup is Mario Yepes. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. From Colombia, um, followed by the captain of Greece, Honduras, and so on. Uh, I'll do one more just to show you. We can uh, we can look at which clubs are contributing the most players here. So we we'll just look at uh, club by count, and we'll see. Oh, that's still giving me captains, maybe? There we go. All right. Yeah, so we can see Barcelona sent the most players, followed by Bayern, uh, followed by Manchester United. So these are the three sample data sets we have. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, Q&A briefly. So if you have any questions, uh, answer any questions. And then we'll open up the workshop. And people can go around and help you get started on using MTAP yourself.